This one takes place back in 2002. I had been a truck driver for nearly a year. I decided to try to acquire a local job so that I could spend every night with my soon-to-be wife. The wedding was only a few months away. She lived in a fairly tiny town. Except for oil field work and dirt transport, there weren't many local truck driving jobs available. I did find a dirt hauling firm that was hiring. The supervisor was present from the very start of the interview. He told me the compensation was $9 per hour, and that was all. There are no races and no benefits, even if you have worked there for almost 20 years. Well, I decided to just accept it because I knew that once we married, my wife would be returning to her hometown to take a job, and there were plenty of driving positions available. On my first day of work, the super supervisor has me fill out papers and tries to make me sign a waiver declining workers' compensation if I am harmed. He assured me that their insurance was far better. However, I had already learned about many of these scams and refused to sign them. This infuriated him. It's a sign that they're trying to screw you, so I have to train with another driver for a week before being assigned to my own truck, which is a good thing because I can study the routes and highways. I hear him instruct the trainer to pick things apart since he doesn't want me on the crew. Unfortunately for him, I do everything perfectly. The trainer's main concern was that I tended to push the clutch too hard when taking off on the first day. I was attempting to get acclimated to the additional high loads and the extremely sensitive clutch. Otherwise, I floated gears like a 50-year-old pro vet. So I finished the week and was assigned my own truck. I perform my pre-trip safety examination as required by rules, and I observe that one of the steer tires is almost to the acceptable wear limit. My personal trainer. Me. Engaged. It is not so simple to push over. Me. Boss guy. It sounds like you simply do not want to work. Me. No, it's legal for now. I'm only informing you that it will need to be changed soon. Are you foolish, boss man? I replaced both steers two months ago. Now hop in the truck or clock out and head home. I'll drive it until it becomes illegal or dangerous to do so. But if I'm penalized, I've got enough witnesses here right now to put it back on you. I got in my truck and headed to work. The boss was irritated, but two days later during my daily inspection, I discovered a fresh set of steer tires. The following week, Boss informs me that we'll be working evenings for the next few days. Keep your speed under control when driving across ranch land. If you hit and kill one of the landowner's 45-000 prize-winning steers, which he earns $20,000 for breeding, I'll chase you off and you'll lose your wages. I burst up laughing really hard. He dislikes this. Boss, what are you laughing about? You don't take me seriously. Is that what the landlord told you? He breeds his prize-winning steer for $20,000 a pop. And you believed him. Boss. I nearly fell to the ground, laughing. Boss. Fine. Return home. Me. Sorry. I did not mean to be disrespectful. It's just that I assume you're from up north, right? From a city. His false southern accent was obvious from the start but I remained quiet about it. So what about it? Me? Well, I'm a city boy too. But even I recognize that a steer is a castrated bull. A prize winning steer can be valued at tens of thousands of dollars, but it cannot be bred. Ask anyone here, they will confirm it. Trainer. Yes, it is true, sir. A steer is a bull without any bulls. My trainer happened to stroll by and heard me laughing so hard. The boss had become white. It doesn't matter. Keep your speed under control or you will end up down the road. The second week closes and the third begins. On the third day, another truck breaks down. So the manager decides to have me hand over my truck to the other driver and travel with my train again. For some reason, boss man decides he wants this to be my last day, but he can't for some reason so he makes it up. He's in a nasty mood. It just backfired on him. At the end of the day, he is waiting for us in the yard when we arrive and park. 
When I arrive at the office to pick up my first two weeks' pay, he is waiting outside. You screwed up today, boy. You nearly killed someone. Me. Really. Please tell me. I received a call from a man who claims you cut him off and ran him off the road. He provided you with truck and trailer numbers and identified you as the driver based on the cap you were wearing. Me. I gave her a smile. Really? At what time did this incident occur? Boss, what is the reason for your smile? You nearly killed a man. I'm letting you go now. You're not a safe driver. Me. No. First, respond to my inquiry. Boss. What does it really matter? I'm under no obligation to respond. You were fired. Me. No. You do have to respond. Remember? That truck had two drivers today. I know I did not cut anyone off today because I did not drive. I can also vouch that trainer did not cut anyone off or run them off the road. So either the guy misinterpreted the truck and trailer numbers or the driver's identification. Two is lying or three. You are the one lying since you've been trying to find fault with everything I do and running me off since the day I refused to sign the workman's compensation waiver. You are a little trainer. He is right. I drove all day and don't remember any problems or close misses. You know I called according to policy, boss. Okay, it is okay. I guess you still have your job, but please know that I am keeping a tight check on you. Me, thank you, and I have no question about it. I opened my check and looked at it as the boss man began to walk away angrily. Me, please wait a minute. There's a $59 deduction for insurance. Remember that we don't have any benefits. Boss. That is for injury insurance, remember? Me. You mean the one I declined and refused to waive workers' compensation for? It's required. Me. I see. So it is deducted whether I sign up or not. Boss. Do you dislike it? Do not let the door touch your ear uh on the way out. Me. That's not legal. Boss. No, it is not. Now get out of my property. I decided to end it right there because there's no point in arguing with a spoiled youngster. It is best to be a better man and walk away. It turns out that the captain of the Texas Department of Public Safety, the Department of Transportation for Truck Drivers, or the state trooper for everyone else in the precinct happens to reside just four houses down from my fiance's apartments. He happened to notice an anonymous message on his windscreen the next morning. The following morning, there were five state police officers with all 15 of the company's trucks pulled over on the side of the roadway, just in front of the company, for a thorough inspection. I was sitting in my car on the shoulder across the highway, sipping my coffee and watching everything unfold. Eleven of the 15 trucks were shut down due to safety issues. Thousands of dollars in fines were issued, and the boss and two other drivers were arrested for warrants. Boss also has an expired commercial driver's license. He was obliged to drive because I did not arrive for work that morning. As you might expect, boss man lost his job. I had relocated to my fiance's hometown and secured a job driving tanker trucks in the oil industry. I've heard the trainer obtained the boss job and everyone lived happily ever after. Maybe not boss, as he has tested positive for drugs. I was adjourned to boss in order to demonstrate to him that I was not easily swayed and would not consume his Kool-Aid. I'm usually a decent guy, even to people who treat me badly. I was friendly at first, but then he pushed me too much. I told my trainer that I was behind the state trooper attack, and he praised me. He informed me that most of the other drivers wanted to thank me as well. Some were concerned about the equipment's safety after being told off for reporting items. Many were new to truck driving and received their licenses through the company. They remarked that through me, they learned that they had rights and that it was good to advocate for them. They were dubious of the waiver, but were afraid to decline it. All but two had promptly removed their workers' compensation exemptions, saving one driver. She was involved in a serious accident approximately a month later and was left permanently disabled. If she had stayed with the company's insurance, she would have been screwed because they did not provide long-term, let alone lifetime, 
disability compensation, and she had discovered that the majority of her medical claims would have been denied. I'm a girl nursing student, 30 years old, an army veteran, and I've always done 90% of the maintenance on my automobiles. The only things I can't perform are tire balancing, since I don't have the necessary tools, and some large-scale tasks that require cherry pickers and other equipment. Once again, I lack the necessary tools. So like any good car owner whose vehicle has sat for an extended length of time without being driven, I went through and maintained my tiny Toyota SR5 truck after returning from a six-month mobilization that had left it in dry storage. I checked and replaced my fan belts, air filters, spark plugs, oil and fuel filters, performed an oil change and radiator flush, examined the battery and connections, and tested my brake pads and alignment. I changed my winter tires for summer tires, cleaned out my truck, and replaced my winter survival kit with summer survival gear, because that was a priority where I lived. Last but not least, I poured injector treatment into my fuel tank, filled it up, and went to my truck to have the tires balanced by a Schwab tire shop. I dressed up because I had other errands to run, and because I'd just spent six months in terrible sandy locations while in uniform. Heels, dress slacks, a silk blouse, and a well-tailored jacket, hair in a bun. Dressed like that, I dropped off my vehicle, agreed that I only needed the tires balanced, and was informed that it would take approximately an hour. Awesome. I was going to walk away to run my other errands down the block when I observed via the big glass window that less upscale establishments have that they were already pushing my truck into the bay, so I decided to wait. And being the curious person I am, I watched as two men began to pull my tires off my truck, while a third, the man who had taken my keys and agreed that I was merely asking for my tires to be balanced, sat in the driver's seat, scribbling down notes on a small notepad. After about 10 minutes, the third person with the notepad returned inside and walked over to me, explaining that during his free inspection of my vehicle, he discovered numerous safety issues that needed to be addressed. I asked him what it was like. Well, it's like this, he said, before going on to fire off a list of 10 or 12 items from his notepad that he had noted during his free examination. The belt needs to be replaced. It is past time to change the oil and flush the radiator. Fuel and oil filters need to be updated. Brake pads need to be replaced. My tires were completely out of alignment and had to be replaced, rather than simply balanced. Everything on his list was something I had recently verified and slash or replaced. He concluded with, I'm very sorry, miss, but your vehicle has a major safety issue. I can't let you drive it in its current condition. Remember, I had just finished all of this work, the majority of which was on his list, and he had never opened the hood of my truck. The majority of what I've written here, as well as what he had on his list, cannot be seen without opening the vehicle. After a minute of deliberation, I asked him how much it would cost to make it roadworthy. He scrunched up his face and scribbled math in his small notebook. A rough estimate is $3,700. However, it may cost extra because your vehicle is officially an import and components may be difficult to obtain. I requested to talk with the manager, but was told he was out for the day. I then responded, so you're telling me that unless I pay $3,700 for work on my car, you can't release it to me, the firearm owner, because it's not safe or roadworthy. Yes. He continued his babble of apologies and explanations in a cunning, fakely remorseful, condescending tone and inquired if there was someone I could confer with regarding such a large repair or if anyone could give me a ride home. I asked him to give me a few minutes, then walked out into the parking lot to use my phone away from him and his mechanics, who were still balancing my tires. And I quickly got off the phone with the sheriff's department. When I explained everything to the officer, he agreed to come out in 15 minutes to help me resolve the issue. I came back inside and told the mechanic, with the nicest smile I could muster, that someone would be here soon to assist me with the situation. 
I also asked him for a list of repairs needed, as well as his quotation, so that I could discuss it with my friend, who was on his way. He gladly offered me the proof for his arrest, and even wrote his name on it, so that I could contact him if I needed more time to ponder the repairs and charges. The cherry on top was that the absent manager arrived just in time to witness the employee being detained, and I received a free tire balance service as a result of what the now former employee attempted to pull.